Hi, I'm Tony Rossi for The Christophers, and today I'll be joined by Katherine Schwarzenegger-Pratt, who will discuss her book, The Gift of Forgiveness, inspiring stories from those who have overcome the unforgivable. We'll also be chatting about the role that religious faith plays in the forgiveness process. Stay with us. Christopher Close-Up starts right now. Hello and welcome to Christopher Close-Up. I'm Tony Rossi. And if you're like most people, you've probably had a hard time forgiving someone who has wronged you at some point in your life. Maybe it was a small slight that was committed against you, or maybe it was a life-changing evil. Either way, holding on to resentment can be corrosive to your own heart and soul, not to the person who wronged you. The best option, difficult as it can be, is the one that Jesus instructed us to follow himself. He said to forgive. New York Times bestselling author Katherine Schwarzenegger Pratt has now written a book that might help you get to the point where you're willing to let go of your anger. It's called The Gift of Forgiveness, inspiring stories from those who have overcome the unforgivable. And she's joining me to talk about that book today. To tell us more, I am pleased to welcome to Christopher Close Up, Katherine Schwarzenegger Pratt. Katherine, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Now, you you start the book, The Gift of Forgiveness, by sharing a little bit of the personal background of your interest in this topic. So let me start by asking, what was your understanding of forgiveness as you were growing up? And how did you learn that concept fell a little bit short as you you got older and life got a little more complicated? Um, Well, I thought that, you know, first and foremost, I always felt like forgiveness was something that required two people in order to achieve, um, forgiveness. And I always just thought growing up that it was something that, you know, someone had to come to you and ask for forgiveness in order for you as the person who may have been wronged to start your forgiveness journey. And what I really realized, uh, as I got older and also as I did this book, especially is that talking to different people, really forgiveness is not about another person. It's really about you and you taking your power back and control of your life. And it's a gift that you give yourself, not to another person. So I think I went through phases of feeling like, you know, maybe forgiveness is something that weak people do. Forgiveness can be something that, you know, almost makes a action or a wrongdoing. Okay. It can feel like a betrayal of your own hurt. And then after doing this book and speaking to all these amazing people, really understanding that it's, um, Forgiveness is actually something that is requires an incredible amount of strength and courage, and it uh, is a example of of us taking our power back and control of our own lives. So that was really helpful for me. Yeah, that that's a great point. And, and one of the things uh, I gathered also from reading the the twenty two stories in this book, The Gift of Forgiveness, is they demonstrate that forgiveness isn't necessarily like like turning on a switch and it sometimes happens right away. It, it's it's a lot of times it's a long term process of making that choice to forgive. What did you learn about the process part of forgiveness while writing the book? Well, what I really learned is that when it comes to forgiveness, the process is so different and unique to every single person. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a really exciting part about forgiveness is that it is so unique and different for all of us. And it's also a really daunting and intimidating part of forgiveness because it, you know, there isn't a one size fits all, you know, map or guideline to follow in order to achieve forgiveness necessarily. So I think just knowing that, um, you know, especially when putting this book together, it was really important to me that all 22 of the people that are in this book have, you know, a a variety of different experiences with forgiveness, struggles with it, and also have all managed to come to forgiveness at different points in their lives, whether it's in the moment of experiencing a wrongful act or 30 years later, and some are still struggling with it today, and it's an ongoing process. So I think that, um, you know, when it comes to a timeline of forgiveness, there is no timeline, and it requires a huge amount of patience, which isn't, uh, I, I don't think, <laughs> the most exciting 
thing to hear from someone is to say that like, you, you know, this requires patience, just be patient <laughs> with your journey and, and sure. be gentle with yourself in it. But it really is the truth that it, you know, your forgiveness journey, when you're able to be patient with yourself, the, the, you know, ability to get to a place of forgiveness is, is an amazing one and a beautiful one. It just, it does for a lot of people, including myself, require a little bit of time. Sure. I'm talking to author Katherine Schwarzenegger Pratt. Her book is titled The Gift of Forgiveness, Inspiring Stories from Those Who Have Overcome the Unforgivable. It's filled with 22 f fantastic, fascinating stories about people who had to forgive, like the title says, some horrific wrongs in their life. And uh, I just want to start with with one story, ask you to tell us about a little bit about Polly Shepard, because uh, we're on Catholic radio right now. And so I, I want to touch on the faith aspect and her story mm -hmm. Uh, specifically it is a uh, deal with that religious, the faith aspect. She's a survivor of Dylan Roof's killing spree at Emanuel AME church in Charleston. Tell us a little bit about Polly and, and her story. Well, Polly was a really amazing interview because I actually watched her do a, uh, an interview about her experience in the Charleston shooting right after it had happened with two other of her, um, of her fellow church uh, friends that were also there and all of them had very, you know, unique experiences and had, you know, lost certain family members and friends in that shooting. And so when I talked to her, I knew that I would be talking to someone who had a very old school mentality on, uh, forgiveness and also faith just being a huge part of her life contributed to her understanding of forgiveness at a very mm -hmm. early age. So she grew up in a, in a family and in a household and in a world where, you know, faith was the main feature in her life. And that formed her understanding and her view on forgiveness as being, um, you know, something that you do as, as a person with faith in your life and, um, and have belief in. Mm -hmm. And so I was really interested in talking to her because she obviously experienced a terrible and horrific act and um and to hear her speak about you know her moments of feeling uh different feelings towards Dylan Roof from the from the beginning of course when you go through your phase of you know feeling anger or frustration or loss about what had happened to her and what had happened to her uh church that she had attended for so many years and also her friends in that church who had lost family members and loved ones. And there was, you know, an understandably, uh, a instant feeling of confusion and anger. Why was this happening? But she quickly, you know, spoke about getting to a place of forgiveness and also, um, wanting to, you know, talk to Dylan Roof and, and, uh, and have a conversation with him about why he chose to do what he did. And also, uh, try to get faith as being a part of his life because someone with, you know, her level of faith and her, the presence of faith that was in her life and is in her life, no one would do what he did. So I think that, you know, the way that she came to it was a place of having compassion and empathy, but also a clear mission to want to spread the power of faith into, into other people's lives, especially Dylan Roof's life, who who clearly she felt did not have that presence. I'm Tony Rossi, and you're listening to Christopher Close Up. I'll be back in a minute with more of my conversation with Katherine Schwarzenegger Pratt. But first, here's a message the Christophers would like to share with you. In the Lord's Prayer, we say the words, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Living out that call to mercy, however, can be a serious challenge. That's why the Christophers have prepared a news note called Forgiving Others and Ourselves. It's filled with stories and insights to help you open your heart and let go of your grudges. And if you yourself are burdened with feelings of guilt or shame, the news note offers suggestions on moving beyond them to an acceptance of God's mercy. To request your free copy of Forgiving Others and Ourselves, send an email to radio at Christophers.org or call our toll-free number at 1-888-298-4050. That's 1-888-298-4050. We look forward to hearing from you.
Welcome back to Christopher Closeup. I'm Tony Rossi talking today with New York Times bestselling author Katherine Schwarzenegger Pratt about her book, The Gift of Forgiveness, inspiring stories from those who have overcome the unforgivable. The book is filled with 22 interviews that Catherine conducted herself with many people who endured horrific circumstances or horrific evils that were done against them. And she shares how they managed to move past the anger, the hatred, the resentment in order to unburden themselves with the gift of forgiveness as Jesus calls us all to forgive. In our next segment, Catherine is also going to talk about the influence her grandparents had on her life. Now, if you don't know her grandparents, they are Sergeant Shriver, who helped found the Peace Corps, and Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who founded the Special Olympics. So now here is more of my interview with Catherine Schwarzenegger Pratt, discussing her book, The Gift of Forgiveness, inspiring stories from those who have overcome the unforgivable. I want to touch on on one more person because I've also interviewed her that you feature in the book, Immaculate Ilabagiza, who survived the Rwandan genocide. And she just has such a story, uh, an incredible story. And it took her a little bit longer, I think, to get to forgiveness, too. Tell a little bit about her and, and her story. Yeah, so Immaculate Ilabagiza is an incredible woman, and she is a... Um, a really strong and inspiring woman whose story, uh, I think, you know, has touched everybody in different ways. And she talks about being in Rwanda during the genocide and hiding out in a bathroom for 90 days with um, several other women and, uh, and how she felt in those 90 days of losing her faith uh, in God in those 90 days and also regaining it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and going through almost a little bit of a forgiveness journey while in hiding and, you know, not knowing the fate of her family, not knowing whether or not she was going to come out to um, them all being killed or, you know, some of them surviving. And when she finally came out of being in hiding, she discovered that her family had been killed by a, uh, one of her neighbors who she grew up considering to be a very close family friend. And so she, of course, had, you know, moments and feelings of anger and rage and uh, loss, sadness, grief, all of those feelings when coming out and realizing that her family was never going to be a part of her life, her daily activity ever again. And she also speaks about going to prison later in her life and sitting across the table from the man that she grew up thinking was a close family friend and uh, had later murdered her entire family. Mm. And she remembers, she recalls and talks about in the book, sitting across the table from him and talking to him about her forgiveness um, journey with him and wanting to forgive him and, and being very clear that she wanted to verbalize that to him. So I think it is an incredibly powerful story. It's a really moving story. And she speaks beautifully about, you know, uh, just trying to cope with the loss of her family and also with her forgiveness journey and how that has played parts in her life over the years and what she's done to kind of help, uh, you know, help in that journey to getting to a place where she could actually live her life moving forward, free of anger, free of rage. And when she has moments of, feeling those feelings, knowing that it's okay, but also understanding that you can be gentle with yourself in that journey. Yeah, yeah. Well, in in doing these interviews, did you get a sense not only of how forgiveness changes the person who grants it, but how it can sometimes change the person on the receiving end of it? Yes, for sure. I think, you know, again, as I was saying in the beginning, I grew up thinking that, you know, you couldn't really start a forgiveness journey it, unless the person who you had felt wronged by or felt had caused you pain or hurt had come to you and said, uh, you know, will you forgive me? Please forgive me. And then you could start your forgiveness journey. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, on the one hand, I think it's beautiful if somebody comes to someone and says, please forgive me. And, and, and they ask for forgiveness and that's granted. And it's a, you know, a beautiful and amazing experience, but what I think is the most important part of that is that the person who had been wronged does not need to wait for that person. So if, if it turns out, you know, in a certain amount of time that somebody comes to you and asks for forgiveness, that's 
you know, icing on a cake, Mm -hmm. but it, it really is about you as a, as an individual starting your forgiveness journey separate from another person asking you for forgiveness. And then if someone does come and ask for forgiveness, you know, years or days or months or whatever, or never does, then that's okay because you've kind of made the effort to work on it on your own. So it's not, you know, contingent upon somebody asking you for forgiveness, uh, to really complete that chapter of your life or to really set yourself free from what had ever happened to you. And I think you see in, in those stories in my book, you see that, you know, some people were able to, to confront the person and write someone a letter or confront them in person about their decision to forgive them. Other people never did that and that's okay. Um, and I think it's also, you know, really amazing to see stories like Ron Hall, who is in my book and he had been unfaithful to his wife. He was convinced that she would never forgive him. She asked for, for, he asked for forgiveness from his wife. She granted it to him. And she said that the one thing that she would ask is that he be the best husband to her, that he could be and help her achieve, achieve all of her dreams. And he talked a lot about the forgiveness that his wife granted him as being Christ-like forgiveness Mm -hmm. and how, when she had a dream that um, she felt God gave her this dream to help this homeless man. And this led to a, you know, a huge mission in her life to help people in the homeless community in her area. And she's since passed away, but he made, you know, Ron Hall made his whole life mission to, finding this man that was in her dream. He found the man in her dream and the, you see how this, you know, this, her act of forgiveness has in turn helped not only their relationship and their family stay together, but also it's helped so many homeless people in need. So you see the ripple effect of forgiveness in a variety of people's stories and in situations and uh, in the book and also just in life. I think you see how, you know, one person's decision to forgive and practice forgiveness really has such an impact, not only on them and their life, of course, but also on the lives of people around them and also people who might not necessarily be around them, but are just touched by their ability to forgive. Yeah, no, it's an impressive story. I know there was a movie made about it called Same Kind of Different as Me. And, uh, Uh and you tell their story beautifully too in the book. And the book is called The Gift of Forgiveness, Inspiring Stories, from those who have overcome the unforgivable. I'm talking to New York Times bestselling author, Catherine Schwarzenegger Pratt. There's also a different type of forgiveness and that's self-forgiveness. And, and you touch yes. on that in the, in the story of, of Sue Klebold a little bit, who people may remember is the father of one of the, uh, the Columbine shooters. Tell us a little bit about that journey, because it's one thing to forgive somebody else, but when it's yourself, we can sometimes be hardest on ourselves. So talk about that idea a while. Yeah. So Sue is the mother of Dylan Klebold. And I think that, you know, a lot of people remember that the Columbine incident, of course, and how terrible and uh, tragic that was. And, you know, again, when I was putting this book together and, and coming up with people to interview, it was really important to me to have a good variety of different experiences with forgiveness, different takes on forgiveness. And, um, just to really create a book that felt well-rounded about, you know, how complex the topic of forgiveness really is. And Sue's interview that I did with her was one of the most interesting interviews that I've done because it was such a different take on forgiveness than I had ever heard. And it was also one that, you know, when I tell people that she's in the book and they go to read her section, I tell people to read her section uh, with an open heart and also with compassion and empathy, because, you know, we, a lot of the times we hear about, you know, unfortunately about, you know, shootings and, and we think about, you know, the people instantly whose, you know, lives have been taken in their families and how, you know, horrific that must be. And, you know, we don't often think about how challenging it must be for the parents of the person who committed that crime. And so Sue's, uh, you know, which I think is an understandable thing, of course. And I think Sue's take on forgiveness was really interesting because she was on the receiving end of people coming up to her as complete strangers and saying to her in the grocery store, you know, I forgive you for what your son has done. And I forgive Mm -hmm. you for, um, you know, from all the horrible acts that your son had committed and, and 
it was interesting to hear that for her, you know, while that's understandable for people to come and say that to her, that the real struggle that she was having at the end of the day was as a mother, not being the mother that her son needed in order to confide in her that he was struggling with mental health issues and depression and loneliness and that, that she has to live with that for the rest of her life, that it's really, um, it's really humanizing her and also listening to the fact that like, it's, you know, something that she has to live with just as much as everybody else has to live with the Columbine shooting that she has to live with, not having been the mother that her son needed and, um, and that she has to live with, you know, never being able to forgive herself for that forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's an incredible story. And just, you mentioned the words compassion and empathy when you were talking about Sue Klebold. And it just reminded me, I just wanted to do a little shift of topic a little bit because your grandparents were, were Sergeant Shriver who helped found the Peace Corps. Your grandmother is Eunice Kennedy Shriver who founded Special Olympics. And I'm just curious, how did your relationship with your grandparents influence the person you've become because this book the gift of forgiveness you know it takes on a higher purpose you're, you're writing about weighty matters that that affect people's hearts and minds and souls D- does some of that come from from your grandparents influence you think of course i think you know my grandparents were huge um figures in my life when they were you know here on earth and still after having uh you know passed their huge parts of my life and i think about them a lot and also carry you know, parts of them and what they taught me when they were here with me. And I think the biggest, you know, lesson that they taught me when I was, you know, growing up was that our purpose on this earth is to make the world a better place and to help others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, both of them did that with, you know, everything, every move that they made, every, uh, you know, every choice that they made. And they, you know, not only decided to create programs and, um, and organizations to help other people in need, but they also always taught us as, as their grandchildren and, you know, taught their kids, my, my mom and my uncles as well, that, you know, you are always, you can always help others. You could always be of service and how you choose to do that is up to you. And our goal here on earth is to make the world a better place, help others in need and to always be of service. And so with my books and especially with this, with this book on forgiveness, you know, my goal with it is to help other people in their forgiveness journey to spread the message and awareness around forgiveness. And, you know, also my goal, as I said to myself from the very beginning is that if one person reads this book and feels less alone in their journey, then this book will have served its purpose. And if, you know, someone reads this book and feels inspired by someone's story in the book to open their hearts to forgiveness and welcome forgiveness into their lives, then this book will have served its purpose. So I think just having that as being a goal with every project that I do and um, every book I do and, and a lot of the things that I do in my life is, is, a, is always a, a goal of wanting to help other people and also make the world a better place. And obviously they did it on a huge scale sure. that is, uh, you know, an incredible one. And, and all of their organizations still live today. Special Olympics, the Peace Corps, Head Start, all of their organizations are, you know, very alive and well and are hugely successful and have helped millions of people. And I think, you know, another amazing part about my grandparents is that they never, uh, it was always about, you know, what we could do throughout our day to help another person, improve another person's day or, or life or, um, the small acts of, of help and the small acts of making the world a better place. And, uh, and, you know, not necessarily having to feel, uh, paralyzed by their huge success and, uh, you know, monumental ability to change the world and make the world a better place. I actually look at it as being incredibly inspiring. So I think that's a huge blessing that they gave all of us. Yeah. And, and of course you, you just said, you know, you haven't done what they've done, but you're still young. Who knows what you're going to accomplish. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Don't downplay that. It seems to be in your blood. So 
<laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think that, you know, it's super important when you come from a family like mine that, you know, has people that are doing, you know, incredible things on all levels and all scales is just to know that, you know, if you find something that you're passionate about and that it's helping another person and helping make the world a better place, then that's the most important thing. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be, um, being president of the United States. It doesn't have to be making one of, you know, the most incredible organizations that helps all intellectually disabled people. Um, we can all help in different ways. And I look at all those, uh, you know, acts in my family, whether it's, you know, my grandparents, my parents, and also my family members that are my age level. It's everyone is doing their own thing on their own level. And I think everyone has an underlying goal of wanting to be of service and help others. And I think that's, that's something that would make my grandparents proud for sure. Yeah, no, that's beautifully said. I'm Tony Ross. You're listening to Christopher Closeup, and I've been talking to Katherine Schwarzenegger Pratt about her book, The Gift of Forgiveness, Inspiring Stories from Those Who Have Overcome the Unforgivable. It's our motto with the Christophers that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And you're certainly fulfilling that with this book. It is full of candles in the darkness. And just like you said, your whole family is doing that. So thank you so much for joining me today and for writing the book, Catherine. It was great talking thank with you. Thank you. Now, before we end today's show, here's a message the Christophers would like to share with you. While the media often focuses on the dark side of humanity, the Christophers believe in highlighting individuals who reflect our motto, it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. By doing so, we hope to inspire others to be Christophers, or Christ bearers, in their own lives. That's why we've prepared a news note called Stories of Modern Day Christ Bearers. You'll be able to read about people who've brought God's love, mercy, and truth to those around them. And maybe these stories will get you thinking about how you can do the same. To request your free copy of Stories of Modern Day Christ Bearers, send an email to radio at Christopher's.org or call our toll-free number at 1-888-298-4050. That's 1-888-298-4050. We look forward to hearing from you. In closing, I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in today, and I encourage you to visit our website at Christophers.org to learn more about the Christophers and to download free literature and podcasts. When you're there, you can also find links to our blog and our Facebook and Twitter pages. And if you have any questions or comments about the show, you can send an email to radio at Christophers.org. Our engineer for today's show is Brian Bonifacio, and I'm Tony Rossi, your host. Thanks again for joining us, and remember that it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness.